So welcome to this video which takes a very comprehensive look at bee health, pests and diseases. The lecture is part of my forthcoming course beginning in beekeeping start your very first beehive. If you'd like to be informed when the course launches please subscribe. Thanks very much and enjoy the lecture. So welcome to this lecture bee health pests and diseases and the question is do bees get sick well unfortunately the answer is yes and in this lecture we're going to look at bee health in general now we do need to be conscious of bee health and if any bee colony seems not to be flourishing we need to investigate and know why and take appropriate action so by the end of the lecture then you're going to have a very good overview of bee health including bee pests and diseases and this is a hugely important area in beekeeping. Now in the follow on activities to this lecture you're going to conduct some research on bee health and the pests and diseases prevalent in your own country or locality. So I want to start with CCD or colony collapse disorder. Now unfortunately bee health is a much bigger issue than it should be and I'd love to say that our bees are generally healthy and have no problems but that's not the case and of course this situation is going to vary from one country to the next but in the USA we had this colony collapse disorder and it first hit honeybees and in that was in 2006 now although affected colonies and respective queens brood and honey stores typically remained intact adult bees living and dead simply vanished so you were left with a very strange situation where you had you know the brood the honey and the queen but then all the adult bees were were gone so it's a very mysterious situation so scientists now believe that CCD is caused by multiple factors and these include exposure to pesticides parasites and pathogens such as bacteria and viruses these are all part of the problem another factor could be dwindling sources of nectar and pollen which impact negatively on nutrition now later on in this lecture I'm going to come to the parasites but varroa destructor is the most serious pest of honeybee colonies around the world so that one we're certainly going to look at later in this lecture now it's not just bee health but also the health of insects we need to be looking at because bees are insects and when we look at the health of insects we see that insects are in decline now i'll give you an example of this there was research uh, which was published in the journal plus one it showed that there was more than a 75 percent decline over 27 years in total flying insect biomass and that was in protected areas in germany and so we're talking about nature reserves here so there was a 75 percent decline in nature reserves but what about agricultural land I mean there must have been a massive decline in agricultural areas so that research is very worrying another paper published in biological conservation and I'll put up the details on the screen it talks about biodiversity of insects is being threatened worldwide so we're talking about over 40 percent of insect species are threatened with extinction of course that's shocking because you know we're so dependent on the web of life for our own survival and insects are so important in that so they also say that you know the reasons for this decline are things like habitat loss for example the intensification of agriculture and that's a main driver in these declines and we're also we have issues around uh, pollutants agrochemical pollutants uh, we also have problems with invasive species and climate change so there's a whole range of factors involved in the decline of insects and we're going to come and look at more of them in detail now how healthy are bees well we have an organization called colos and i put a link to that in the resources section uh, so you can go on there and have a look at colos but it's a, an international ngo 
headquartered in Switzerland and it focuses on improving the well-being of bees at a global level. Now, recent research from Colos published in 2020 shows that from a total of 28,629 beekeepers, they wintered 738,233 colonies, but they lost 16.7% of them. So that's 123,000 colonies lost in 35 countries that were surveyed over the winter of 2018 and 2019. Now, these bee colonies would be lost for a variety of reasons, including pests and diseases, and perhaps uh, you know, pesticides would be another cause, and others as well. Now, the University of Maryland in the United States reported that American beekeepers lost 44.1% of their bee colonies between March 2015 and April 2016. And of course, that's a high rate of colony loss, and that actually made the news. Again, you know, all those kind of factors are involved, but also including varroa mites uh, as one of the big culprits. So I think it's important, you know, when you hear these kind of statistics that uh, to understand that colony losses, unfortunately, are, are there. And as a beginner in bees, you should realize that unfortunately, colony, colony losses are losses uh, of uh, beehives or the bees die out is something you know, is commonly experienced even for experienced beekeepers and they're losing colonies. So if you do end up losing a colony, you shouldn't become so distressed by it. You know, this is part of nature and this is going on all the time. So I think that's a comfort thing, thing to know as a beginner. Now, unfortunately, you know, you, do, you do certainly don't want to lose a colony, but if it does happen, you know, you just get on with it because this is something that's common and I've given you those statistics and it's something that's going on all the time. Now, as I said, you know, like it's part of beekeeping. And even if I look at my own country in certain years, for example, in 2012 and 2013 in Ireland, 37 percent of colonies were lost over the winter. And that particular year was bad because in 2012 we had a wet summer and the bees weren't able to get out and to do their mating, you know, mate the queens and they weren't able to collect a honey crop. It was one of the wettest summers, the wettest and darkest days of the year were recorded in traditionally sunny June. So and that had a very negative impact on the bees. So there are all these factors then that, you know, have negative impacts on bees and cause losses. Now I'll come to the next point and this is about neonicotinoids and this is a widely used group of insecticides globally. Now in Ireland in 2021 there was some research published from Trinity College and DCU Dublin City University and they found that neonicotinoid pesticide resi residues were in Irish honey and they looked at 30 honey samples and 70% contained at least one neonicotinoid compound. Now these are systemic um, insecticides and they're basically getting into honey. And it's not just in Ireland, but it's these pesticides are getting into honey worldwide. Now, the thing was that they didn't just sample you know, from colonies in agricultural areas, but also urban uh, domestic areas and sports and amenity contexts as well. So this is not just a problem associated with agriculture. Now, in the European Union, uh, we have restricted the use of neonicotinoid uh, insecticides because of their effects on, on, on bees and other non-target organisms. And you know, in, you'll have to check in your country whether these uh, insecticides are in use. And certainly they are still in use in many countries, even the United States. So it's, that'll be part of the next assignment to really understand if these insecticides are used. And sometimes they may have restricted uses, but, you know, farmers groups or whatever may lobby for particular circumstances to be allowed to use these insecticides. But they are very, very risky for bees uh, and other pollinators. Now, bee health 
therefore, I mean, I, up to now you get the idea that BHAV is a complex issue. I've mentioned issues around climate, I've mentioned um, issue, issues around disease, be pests, um, weather events, genetics, pesticides, all of these factors are feeding into bee health and even into the wider insect health. And there's a very good video that I recommend you watch. It's a TED talk by Dr. Marla Spivak and it's titled Why Bees Are Disappearing. So I'd recommend that you watch that. Um, it's a very, very useful talk. So when I was beekeeping in Ireland in the 1980s and the early 1990s, bee health was a lot less of an issue than it is today. And in 1998, varroa mites appeared in Ireland. And these are just a terrible pest. They're a major pest of bees worldwide. And then, you know, from that point, from there on, they spread throughout the country. These varroa mites, they got in every colony. They destroyed a lot of the wild bees from the, there used to be bees in trees, nesting in trees and in roofs of houses. They were all uh, destroyed by this uh, pest. And basically now the mite is a pandemic in Ireland and is in practically every colony. And they're in most, a lot of colonies around the world. They've spread into Africa, they're in America. They haven't got into Australia yet, but they're in a lot of countries. So again, you'll be checking the prevalence of varroa in the next activity in your country. But basically varroa spread from the native host, the Asian honeybee, Apis serrana, to the European honeybee, Apis mellifera, uh, which is used commercially around the world for pollination. And varroa is the greatest threat to honeybee health worldwide. Okay, so Beekeepers then have to use uh, medicines to manage the pests and beekeepers in the UK, Europe, North America, uh, they're also using these medicines. So let's go on then and look at pests. And I've put a definition of a pest there. It's a destructive insect or other animal that attacks crops, food, livestock, etc. And they're going to vary from one country to another. For example, the pest that I've shown you there on the screen, it's um, a woodpecker where they, these woodpeckers damage hives and feed on the bee brood. But for example, in my country, we don't have them. So if I was looking at a book from Britain, they would be talking about protecting the hives from woodpeckers. So pests are going to vary between one country and another. Now, for example, in parts of North America, beekeepers have to protect hives from bears. Where I worked in Eastern Africa, a big focus was on crawling pests like ants. In fact, ants, like, uh, types of ants like safari ants were, could decimate a colony very, very quickly. Within a matter of hours, they could destroy a colony. There are also animals like the honey badger in East Africa and Southern Africa, um, which break open hives and eat all the bees and honey. So they're a very, very difficult pest in many areas. And again, you know, for example, in my country, we don't have honey badgers. So pests are going to vary from one region to the next. So that's why that activity, you know, to find out the pests and diseases and the issues for your particular country is very important because the bee health situation is going to be different. Now, the next pest I want to come to are rodents in general, rodents like mice. And you can see there in my, this is a polystyrene nucleus box. And basically the mouse has eaten. You can see where I'm pointing there. The mouse has eaten and destroyed the box, made holes all over the place. Um, it would have also destroyed the combs, disturbed the bees. And you'd find in many cases that the bees would not overwinter well or they'd die out because of being disturbed by the uh, mice, rodents in the hive. And I used to find rodents also in Eastern Africa in the hives there. So they would, uh, in Eastern Africa, not necessarily get in when the, the hive is occupied with the bees, but they'd get in when the hive is empty. So the rodent would then prevent bees occupying the hive, a swarm of bees, because the rodent would build a nest inside and the, the bees wouldn't want to occupy that hive. So it was a job to keep the hives clear of rodents and to clean them out afterwards because the rodents would, uh, I suppose, urinate in the hives and then that would um, deter the bees, bee swarms from occupying the hive. 
But rodents are also um, a real problem in stored honey. So you really have to be careful how you store your honey and also your combs because they will get in there and destroy them. So rodents can be a real nuisance. Another pest is wasps of all kinds. Now, you're going to have different wasps in different countries, but in Ireland we have this particular wasp and in August, this would be the same in the UK, in August the wasps' nests break up and you see a lot of wasps around and they can get into hives, they can attack colonies and basically decimate a colony and rob out a colony of all its honey. You know, the, the way to deal with that is to narrow down the entrance of the hives in the autumn, to, if you, especially if you see wasps being attacking hives and you'll see them hanging around the entrance trying to get into hives. And as I said, they can overwhelm a weaker colony. So wasps can be a particular nuisance. Uh, this is the Asian hornet. Now, the Asian hornet has been found in Britain in 2016. In my country, it hasn't been found yet, but it is a threat and it could spread here too. Now, the Asian hornet is native in Southeast Asia and it, prob it was probably introduced by accident. It came into Europe from China and it was first found in France in 2005. And since it has spread to Spain in 2010, Portugal and Belgium in 2011, Italy in 2012 and Germany in 2014 and then Great Britain as I mentioned in 2016. It is a, a nuisance of a pest, it attacks colonies, it basically hangs around outside the entrance, it grabs bees as they try and fly in and out and then the bees are essentially afraid to fly because they're going to be grabbed by these hornets and uh, beheaded and taken back as food back to the hornet nest. So you can actually uh, watch some interesting uh, video of how the hornets impact on the bee colonies. Um, there's a on the British Beekeepers Association website and I'll put up a link there. You can watch a video, especially from uh, French beekeepers, showing the impact of the hornets on their honeybees. So a really nasty pest and um, certainly don't want to see it in Ireland and hopefully in the UK they'll be able to eradicate it. In 2020 there was one uh, sighting of Asian hornets and the nest was destroyed but of course there may be others so sometimes um, it can be hard to track down all the nests and certainly since um, 2016 there have been numerous sightings each year and nests have been destroyed but still it's, a, it's very difficult to completely uh, eradicate it once it gets in. Okay, the next pest I want to talk about is the greater wax moth and the lesser wax moth. Now, wax moths are a real nuisance, especially for stored comb. So your honeycombs, you know, when you take off the honey, you put it in the extractor, you extract the honey and then you have the combs left. Now the wax moth can get into those combs, your super frames, and destroy them or any brood frames you've lying around or stored. So it's a real nuisance and if you know, you know of course the effort uh, to get beeswax, to, to buy foundation, to have the bees draw it out and then for these moths to go in and lay their eggs and then the larvae to go and destroy the combs it's a real nuisance and a real problem for the beekeeper and you can see here in the corner up at the the left hand top corner this is the larvae and that goes and destroys the comb so you really have to be careful you know how you store uh, your extracted combs and um, you know, if you can store them in a cold place, that's good because it prevents the moths being very active. And also there are different ways recommended to prevent the moth. But one of the ways is to store your combs wet once you extract the supers and then place them into black bin bags and store them securely so that you can't have the moths accessing the stored combs and also they don't they don't like laying eggs when the combs are wet with honey so that's one particular way that we use to try and prevent damage to the stored combs so 
it is a nuisance of a pest, wax moth. And of course, we also had it in Africa as well. So it's all over the world. And you'll check as well in the next activity um, if it's in your country and the level of wax moth risk in your country. Now, this uh, pest is the small hive beetle. Now, the small hive beetle, Athena tumida, is native to sub-Saharan Africa and was found in Europe for the first time in southwest Italy in 2014. Now, it's not in countries like Ireland or in the UK. It is spreading around the world. It is in the United States, for example. Again, you're going to check if it's in your country. In this particular pest, you know, when I was teaching beekeeping in Kenya or Eastern Africa, we wouldn't mention this as a major pest. It was just a minor pest in hives, in particular in weaker colonies. But in other races of bee, in European races of bee, it is a really serious pest. The larvae burrow in the comb and they cause the fermentation of stored honey or the honey in the comb. So it really is a nuisance of a pest and we certainly don't want to see it spread further into Europe. And uh, there are efforts in Italy to try and eradicate this pest. Uh, that's a small hive beetle. Again, you'll need to check if it is present in your country. Okay then, so we're going to come now to Varroa mites. And I mentioned before, this is an absolute dreadful pest worldwide. And you can see the mite on the back of the bee there. You can see this, the red mite, kind of a crab shaped flat mite, brownish red in color, oval. And here's a mite here on the larvae of the bees. And this is, this is the larvae here, the white larvae, and this is a mite feeding on the larvae. So you can have them on the adults or you can have them in the brood. So recent research showed that Varroa Destructor, act, it's called Varroa Destructor, as you see there on the name, it actually feeds on the honey bee fat body tissue and it doesn't feed on the blood. People used to think it, it fed on the blood, but recent research showed that it actually feeds on the fat tissue. Now that has various effects on the bees. For example, in drones, it has been demonstrated, now drones, as re remember, are male bees, and in drones, the Varroa Destructor reduces the weight and results in decreased flight performance and sperm production. Now, there also have been reports of impaired orientation and homing ability of foraging bees infested with mites as well. So again, they you know get lost uh, on the way back to their colony or they don't return at all. So it's going to affect honey production. The big thing about Varroa as well that is that they spread viruses and there are various viruses and I'm going to come and I'm going to tell you later in the lecture just, you know, about the different viruses. It's a bit like, you know, how mosquitoes transmit malaria, that uh, these mites are transmitting bee viruses. So when it comes to treatment of Varroa, there's no treatment that's going to kill all the mites in the colony. Now you can apply treatment when the level of mites reach a certain level where they're going to affect the health of the colony. Now the threshold is around two mites per hundred bees. Now research in France showed that an infestation rate of three mites per hundred bees is sufficient to significantly reduce the production of lavender honey by the colony. And Varroa numbers higher than five mites per hundred bees puts the colony at great risk. Now it's important to be able to check the level of mites and there are different ways to do this and the first one is open mesh floor with monitoring board so you have a monitoring board to be able to measure the number of mites that drop from the bees the second method is by uncapping drone brood and you know checking how many mites are on the drone brood now the third method is the sugar shake test and I'm going to show you the sugar shake test. I'm going to take you through the steps on how to do this to show you how to measure the number of mites. And I'm going to attach that as an activity. And I want you to go and be, test out this method of assessing the level of Varroa mites if you have Varroa in your country so that you'll be able to measure the number of mites 
in your colony per 100 bees or at least estimate the number of mites. So that's very important. So you're going to come to that activity. It's coming up the sugar shake test. Now the fourth method is the alcohol roll and this method is slightly different to the sugar shake test in that it kills the bees. Okay, so that's measuring the, the mite levels in the colony and as I said we're going to use number three, the sugar shake test and that's coming up in an activity. Now in terms of treatment of Varroa, the best approach is an integrated pest management approach. Now, which that means is essentially a combination of methods, such as using a screened bottom board, mite trapping in drone brood, varroa resistant stock, naturally derived chemicals such as oxalic acid and thymol, and hard chemicals such as acaricides and miticides. Now, there are various chemicals used for treating Varroa and these are going to vary perhaps from one country to another. So again, that's going to be part of your activities to find out about the Varroa treatments in your country. Um, I know, for example, in my country in Ireland, we have particular products which are licensed for use and we have guidelines issued on treating Varroa destructor by our national organizations. Now I'll just mention that when I worked in Africa, Apis mellifera scutellata appeared to be resistant to mite infestations and certainly in countries like Kenya and Eastern Africa we were not recommending any treatment for Varroa because the bees are resistant to it and this may have something to do with the lack of uh, you know, human interference that basically the bees have been allowed to just become resistant themselves to the mite. So there are people also who advocate for a similar approach here just to let the bees uh, just overcome Varroa or build resistance for Varroa. And certainly there are attempts to breed uh, resistant bees, Varroa resistant bees, and certain races of bees are more resistant to Varroa than others. So genetics does play an, an important aspect in combating Varroa. Now here is another pest called the Tropilolaps species. Now these mites are not in Europe but they are always a potential threat. Now the primary hosts for these are the large Asian honeybee Apis dorsata but you know we still have to be vigilant and watch out for this. This is why I'm showing you. And again, you need to check are these mites in your particular country. And I know in my country, in Ireland, if you do come across these mites, it is a notifiable disease. And that means you have to notify the agricultural authorities that you suspect you've found these mites. Okay, the next um, slide I'm showing you a disease of bees now I've moved on from pests but also there are other diseases that bees suffer from and this particular disease American fowl brood is one that uh, really disturbs a lot of beekeepers and scares a lot of beekeepers I know and certainly in my country it does and again it's a notifiable disease you have to notify the authorities the agricultural authorities in my country the department of agriculture food and the marine if you suspect you have this now this is as i said the disease that the beekeepers certainly here fear the most because there's no treatment now the bees have to be killed and the hives have to be burned and that's because the disease the organism forms a spore so that spore can last for many years so it's very difficult to eradicate this because of those spores and those spores are very hardy so they can last for decades so the only way then is to burn to kill the spores now if I look at the statistics from Ireland uh, we had 23 cases of American fowl brood reported in Ireland in 2020 uh, one of the things is you should not feed shop honey to bees of the unknown origin because it may have 
the spores of American fowl brood. Now, one of the ways to tell if you have American fowl brood, the brood becomes sunken, it smells, and then when you stick in something like a matchstick and you put, you twirl it up and pull it out, it has this ropey constituency. So that's an indicator that you have American fowl brood. And if you do, you really need to quarantine. You don't want to spread this to other beekeepers and you need to contact your local bee authorities and send a sample to get clear if you have this disease or not. So you probably have or you may have a diagnostic service for beekeepers in your country. We certainly do here in Ireland and I know in other countries they have. So just to get confirmation if you have American fowl brood and then the authorities will instruct you what to do. But more than likely you're going to have to kill your bees and burn the hives. The next one we want I want to come to is European fowl brood. Now this is a bacterial brood disease, but it doesn't form spores, so it's easier to I suppose deal with than American fowl brood. The bacteria attack the larvae and the larvae die, and normally, you know, this occurs shortly before before the cells are capped, and as I mentioned, it doesn't form spores. So treatment for European fowl brood can be slightly different depending on the level of the disease. For example, you could use antibiotics or burning or something called a shook swarm to treat this disease. And I'll come and I'll show you how to do a shook swarm later in the course. Now, in my country, in Ireland, European fowl brood is a notifiable disease. If we suspect we have it, we have to notify the authorities, the, the Department of Agriculture. Now, moving on, uh, this is a tracheal mite, acarine, and it's a parasitic mite, acarpus woody, and it causes this disease, acarine disease in honeybees, by infesting the breathing tubes or the trachea of the adult bee. And it piercing the tracheal wall and feeding on the bee hemolymph, which is a bee blood. And you can see the mites here in the breathing tubes of the bee. See the mites inside here, uh, feeding on the bee's hemolymph, on the blood. And you need a microscope to be able to see these. So again, you need to be able to send off a sample of 30 adult bees to your bee diagnostic center. You know, they'll be able to tell you if you have acarine or not. And the best long term solution is to breed from bee colonies which show resistance to this disease. And let's move on to the next one. And the next one is Nozema. And this causes a disease called Nozemosis. And it's caused by this microsporidian, which is a spore forming unicellular parasite. There are two species, the Nozema apis and Nozema serrana. Now, in many inst instances, both species co-infect. Now, basically, adult bees eat the spores with food or water, and then the spores germinate and multiply within the lining of the bee's midgut. And millions of spores are shed into the digestive tract and eliminated in the feces. Again, microscopy or using a microscope is necessary to confirm the presence of these spores. And you can see on the screen there, um, the researchers are looking at the spores. You can see the little, these are the spores that are visible under the microscope. Again, the way to avoid nosema is to practice good bee husbandry and avoid stressing the bees because stressed colonies which have poor nutrition and a long confinement and starvation can lead to a depressed immune system which allows this parasite to emerge. So that's how we, we keep this parasite in check, just good management. And one of the signs is defecation at the front of the hive or on the top bars and this often indicates this disease. And again, send a sample off to your local bee diagnostic centre and they will confirm if you have this disease or not. The next one I'm coming to is chalk brood. Now chalk brood is a fungal brood disease of honeybees and is caused by a spore forming fungus called Ascophera apis. Now the presence of hard white, black or greyish pellets in cells are an indication of chalk brood. 
and basically bees eat spores of the fungus with the larval food and chalk brood is fairly common and you're going to see it from time to time in your hives for example in Ireland in 2017 chalk brood was identified in 40 percent of samples tested by the bee diagnostic center in the country so it's quite common there are no specific treatments available for chalk brood just again to keep a strong healthy colony with weatherproof hives you know to keep it out the rain and the damp and which have appropriate ventilation and again good management is going to limit the presence of chalk brood now I'm going to come on to viruses there are about 24 honeybee associated viruses which have been identified in the western honeybee Apis mellifera now Varroa mites, as I mentioned before, they act as vectors for a variety of these diseases. For example, the deformed wing virus. This one is the most visible one because of its obvious symptoms, which are the deformed wings. Now, as regards treatment, there are no specific antiviral treatments available or recommended for bees. And basically, preventing viruses is all about good bee husbandry. And for example, tackling your varroa problem because as I mentioned varroa spread the viruses now your focus as a beekeeper is to control major pests and diseases as I mentioned varroa mites but also acarine and nosema and this is an image of a bee which has been affected by deformed wing virus and you can see the wings here are completely destroyed and useless so Again, the only means of controlling this virus is to control the varroa mite infestation. And once you start seeing a lot of bees like this in the colony, it indicates there's a high mite infestation. So bee health then is a huge issue. It's a big topic and you can see there are many, many pests and parasites and the things that are going to attack bees, even pesticides. So it warrants its own even separate course but from the perspective of this course you're focused on getting starting started in beekeeping so it's important just to be aware of all these pests don't be freaked out by it you know you're going to come and learn about all of them but since you're starting off and perhaps you've bought a healthy uh, nucleus colony of bees from a reputable supplier then you're not going to have to worry too much about you know health issues starting off because you're going to be starting off with a healthy colony you'd expect to start off with a healthy colony if the supplier you bought from it is reputable so that's something very positive so even if you started with a swarm of bees hopefully they're going to be healthy and they're not going to bring any pests or diseases with them or at least for example with varroa mites you know they're going to be at low levels so they're going to have left most of the mites in the brood when they swarm for example you can see on the figures there from the research about 75 percent or so of the mites are left in the parent colony so that gives the swarm a starting point with a lower level of mites so overall it's important to think apiary hygiene you know cleaning your bee equipment and tools just practicing hygiene don't leave bits of comb lying around don't allow hives to be robbed out of a colony that is weak. Don't feed the honey to the bees, you know, of foreign honey or honey from unknown sources to bees. These are kind of basic hygiene steps that all of us need to practice just to avoid spreading some of these diseases within the apiary. Another one is when inspecting the hives, avoid crushing or squashing bees as far as possible because, again, that's going to perhaps expose the bees to a gut disease like nosema. So in this lecture then I've introduced this big topic of bee health. As you can see it's a big topic, there are various pests and diseases and it's also linked to bee nutrition and again linked to the weather, the flowers and the environment and the things like pesticides and as you can see it's a big complex topic with a lot of different factors involved. But as a beginner, you know, it's important that you're aware, but don't be freaked out by this. Your bees are going to be fine. Don't panic. And probably your biggest challenge may be varroa mites. So next is an activity to look at the bee pests and diseases 
and problems in your particular country. For example, you know, are neonicotinoid pesticides used in your country? So that kind of research to understand the local circumstances. And that lovely animal you see on the screen looking at you there, that's a honey badger. And certainly in Kenya, where I worked and in Eastern Africa, that was a big problem, a big pest for beekeepers. But of course, it's not here in Ireland. So you need to be aware of the particular pests and diseases for your particular country. So that activity is very important. So see you in the next activity.